Part 1 of the First Apology of Justin Martyr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. The First Apology by Justin Martyr. Translated by Alexander Roberts and James Donaldson. Part 1, Chapters 1 through 19. Chapter 1. Address. To the Emperor Titus Aelius Adrianus Antoninus Pius Augustus Caesar, and to his son Verissimus the Philosopher, and to Lucius the Philosopher, the natural son of Caesar, and the adopted son of Pius, a lover of learning, and to the sacred Senate, with the whole people of the Romans, I, Justin, the son of Priscius and grandson of Bacchius, natives of Flavia Neapolis in Palestine, present this address and petition in behalf of those of all nations who are unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. Chapter 2. Justice Demanded Reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what is true, declining to follow traditional opinions, if these be worthless. For not only does sound reason direct us to refuse the guidance of those who did or taught anything wrong, but it is incumbent on the lover of truth, by all means, and if death be threatened even before his own life, to choose and do and say what is right. Do you, then, since ye are called pious and philosophers, guardians of justice and lovers of learning, give good heed and hearken to my address, and if ye are indeed such, it will be manifested." For we have come not to flatter you by this writing, nor please you by our address, but to beg that you pass judgment, after an accurate and searching investigation, not flattered by prejudice or by a desire of pleasing superstitious men, nor induced by irrational impulse or evil rumors which have long been prevalent, to give a decision which will prove to be against yourselves. For as for us, we reckon that no evil can be done us, unless we be convicted as evildoers or be proved to be wicked men, and you, you can kill, but not hurt us. Chapter 3. Claim of Judicial Investigation But lest any one think that this is an unreasonable and reckless utterance, we demand that the charges against the Christians be investigated, and that, if these be substantiated, they be punished as they deserve or rather, indeed, we ourselves will punish them. But if no one can convict us of anything, true reason forbids you, for the sake of a wicked rumor, to wrong blameless men, and indeed rather yourselves, who think fit to direct affairs, not by judgment, but by passion. And every sober-minded person will declare this to be the only fair and equitable adjustment, namely, that the subjects render an unexceptional account of their own life and doctrine, and that, on the other hand, the rulers should give their decision in obedience, not to violence and tyranny, but to piety and philosophy. For thus would both rulers and ruled reap benefit. For even one of the ancients somewhere said, unless both rulers and ruled philosophize, it is impossible to make states blessed. It is our task, therefore, to afford to all an opportunity of inspecting our life and teachings, lest, on account of those who are accustomed to be ignorant of our affairs, we should incur the penalty due to them for mental blindness. And it is your business, when you hear us, to be found, as reason demands, good judges. For if, when ye have learned the truth, you do not what is just, you will be before God without excuse. Chapter 4. Christians Unjustly Condemned for Their Mere Name by the mere application of a name, nothing is decided, either good or evil, apart from the actions implied in the name. And indeed, so far at least as one may judge from the name we are accused of, we are the most excellent people. But as we do not think it just to beg to be acquitted on account of the name, if we be convicted as evildoers, so, on the other hand, if we be found to have committed no offense, either in the matter of thus naming ourselves, or of our conduct as citizens, it is your part very earnestly to guard against incurring just punishment by unjustly punishing those who are not convicted. For from a name neither praise nor punishment could reasonably spring, unless something excellent or base in action be proved. 
And those among yourselves who are accused you do not punish before they are convicted, but in our case you receive the name as proof against us. And this, although, so far as the name goes, you ought rather to punish our accusers. For we are accused of being Christians, and to hate what is excellent, Christian, is unjust. Again, if any of the accused deny the name, and say that he is not a Christian, you acquit him, as having no evidence against him as a wrongdoer. But if any one acknowledge that he is a Christian, you punish him on account of this acknowledgment. Justice requires that you inquire into the life both of him who confesses and of him who denies, that by his deeds it may be apparent what kind of man each is. For as some who have been taught by the Master, Christ, not to deny him, give encouragement to others when they are put to the question, so in all probability to those who lead wicked lives give occasion to those who, without consideration, take upon them to accuse all the Christians of impiety and wickedness. And this also is not right. For of philosophy, too, some assume the name and the garb who do nothing worthy of their profession, and you are well aware that those of the ancients whose opinions and teachings were quite diverse are yet all called by the one name of philosophers. And of these some taught atheism, and the poets who have flourished among you raise a laugh out of the uncleanness of Jupiter with his own children, and those who now adopt such instruction are not restrained by you, but, on the contrary, you bestow prizes and honors upon those who euphoniously insult the gods. Chapter 5. Christians Charged with Atheism Why then should this be? In our case, who pledge ourselves to do no wickedness, nor to hold these atheistic opinions, you do not examine the charges made against us, but, yielding to unreasoning passion, and to the instigation of evil demons, you punish us without consideration or judgment. For the truth shall be spoken, since of old these evil demons, effecting apparitions of themselves, both defiled women and corrupted boys, and showed such fearful sights to men, that those who did not use their reason in judging of the actions that were done, were struck with terror, and being carried away by fear, and not knowing that these were demons, they called them gods, and gave to each the name which each of the demons chose for himself. And when Socrates endeavored, by true reason and examination, to bring these things to light, and deliver men from the demons, then the demons themselves, by means of men who rejoiced in iniquity, compassed his death, as an atheist and a profane person, on the charge that he was introducing new divinities, and in our case they display a similar activity. For not only among the Greeks did reason, logos, prevail to condemn these things through Socrates, but also among the barbarians were they condemned by reason, or the word, the Logos, himself, who took shape and became man, and was called Jesus Christ. And in obedience to him, we not only deny that they who did such things as these are gods, but assert that they are wicked and impious demons, whose actions will not bear comparison with those even of men desirous of virtue. Chapter 6 charge of atheism refuted. Hence we are called atheists, and we confess that we are atheists so far as the gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the most true God, the Father of righteousness and temperance and the other virtues, who is free from all impurity. But both him and the Son, who came forth from him and taught us these things, and the host of the other good angels who follow and are made like to him, and the prophetic spirit, we worship and adore, knowing them in reason and truth, and declaring without grudging to every one who wishes to learn, as we have been taught. Chapter 7. Each Christian must be tried by his own life. But someone will say, some have ere now been arrested and convicted as evildoers, for you condemn many, many a time, after inquiring into the life of each of the accused severally, but not on account of those of whom we have been speaking, and this we acknowledge, that as among the Greeks those who teach such theories as please themselves are all called by the one name philosopher, though their doctrines be diverse, so also among the barbarians this name on which accusations are accumulated is the common property of those who are and those who seem wise. For all are called Christians. 
Wherefore we demand that the deeds of all those who are accused to you be judged, in order that each one who is convicted may be punished as an evildoer, and not as a Christian. And if it is clear that any one is blameless, that he may be acquitted, since by the mere fact of his being a Christian he does no wrong. For we will not require that you punish our accusers, they being sufficiently punished by their present wickedness and ignorance of what is right. Chapter 8 Christians Confess Their Faith in God And reckon ye that it is for your sakes that we have been saying these things, for it is in our power, when we are examined, to deny that we are Christians. But we would not live by telling a lie. For, impelled by the desire of the eternal and pure life, we seek the abode that is with God, the Father and Creator of all, and hasten to confess our faith, persuaded and convinced as we are that they who have proved to God by their works that they followed him, and loved to abide with him where there is no sin to cause disturbance, can obtain these things. This, then, to speak shortly, is what we expect and have learned from Christ, and teach. And Plato, in like manner, used to say that Radamanthus and Minos would punish the wicked who came before them, and we say that the same thing will be done, but at the hand of Christ, and upon the wicked in the same bodies united again to their spirits, which are now to undergo everlasting punishment, and not only, as Plato said, for a period of a thousand years. And if any one say that this is incredible or impossible, this error of ours is one which concerns ourselves only, and no other person, so long as you cannot convict us of doing any harm. Chapter 9. Folly of Idol Worship And neither do we honor with many sacrifices and garlands of flowers such deities as men have formed and set in shrines and called gods, since we see that these are soulless and dead, and have not the form of God, for we do not consider that God has such a form as some say that they imitate to his honor, but have the names and forms of those wicked demons which have appeared. For why need we tell you who already know, into what forms the craftsmen, carving and cutting, casting and hammering, fashion the materials? And often, out of vessels of dishonor, by merely changing the form, and making an image of the requisite shape, they make what they call a god, which we consider not only senseless, but to be even insulting to God, who, having ineffable glory and form, thus gets his name attached to things that are corruptible, and require constant service, and that the artificers of these are both intemperate, and, not to enter into particulars, are practiced in every vice, you very well know, even their own girls who work along with them they corrupt. What infatuation, that dissolute men should be said to fashion and make gods for your worship, and that you should appoint such men the guardians of the temples where they are enshrined, not recognizing that it is unlawful even to think or say that men are the guardians of gods. Chapter 10. How God is to be served. But we have received by tradition that God does not need the material offerings which men can give, seeing, indeed, that he himself is the provider of all things. And we have been taught, and are convinced, and do believe, that he accepts those only who imitate the excellences which reside in him, temperance and justice and philanthropy, and as many virtues as are peculiar to a God who is called by no proper name. And we have been taught that he in the beginning did of his goodness, for man's sake, create all things out of unformed matter. And if men by their works show themselves worthy of this his design, they are deemed worthy. And so we have received, of reigning in company with him, being delivered from corruption and suffering. For as in the beginning he created us when we were not, so do we consider that, in like manner, those who choose what is pleasing to him are, on account of their choice, deemed worthy of incorruption and of fellowship with him. For the coming into being at first was not in our own power, and in order that we may follow those things which please him, choosing them by means of the rational faculties he has himself endowed us with, he both persuades us and leads us to faith. And we think it for the advantage of all men that they are not restrained from learning these things, but are even urged thereto. For the restraint which human laws could not effect, the word, inasmuch as he is divine, would have effected, 
had not the wicked demons, taking as their ally the lust of wickedness which is in every man, and which draws variously to all manner of vice, scattered many false and profane accusations, none of which attach to us. Chapter 11. What Kingdom Christians Look For and when you hear that we look for a kingdom, you suppose, without making any inquiry, that we speak of a human kingdom, whereas we speak of that which is with God, as appears also from the confession of their faith made by those who are charged with being Christians, though they know that death is the punishment awarded to him who so confesses. For if we looked for a human kingdom, we should also deny our Christ, that we might not be slain, and we should strive to escape detection, that we might obtain what we expect. But since our thoughts are not fixed on the present, we are not concerned when men cut us off, since also death is a debt which must at all events be paid. Chapter 12. Christians Live as Under God's Eye And more than all other men are we your helpers and allies in promoting peace seeing that we hold this view, that it is alike impossible for the wicked, the covetous, the conspirator, and for the virtuous, to escape the notice of God, and that each man goes to everlasting punishment or salvation according to the value of his actions. For if all men knew this, no one would choose wickedness even for a little, knowing that he goes to the everlasting punishment of fire, but would by all means restrain himself, and adorn himself with virtue, that he might obtain the good gifts of God, and escape the punishments. For those who, on account of the laws and punishments you impose, endeavor to escape detection when they offend, and they offend, too, under the impression that it is quite possible to escape your detection, since you are but men, those persons, if they learned and were convinced that nothing, whether actually done or only intended, can escape the knowledge of God, would by all means live decently on account of the penalties threatened, as even you yourselves will admit. But you seem to fear lest all men become righteous, and you no longer have any to punish. Such would be the concern of public executioners, but not of good princes. But, as we before said, we are persuaded that these things are prompted by evil spirits, who demand sacrifices and service even from those who live unreasonably. But as for you, we presume that you who aim at a reputation for piety and philosophy will do nothing unreasonable. But if you also, like the foolish, prefer custom to truth, do what you have power to do. But just so much power have rulers who esteem opinion more than truth, as robbers have in a desert. And that you will not succeed is declared by the word, than whom, after God who begat him, we know there is no ruler more kingly and just. For as all shrink from succeeding to the poverty or sufferings or obscurity of their fathers, so whatever the word forbids us to choose, the sensible man will not choose. That all these things should come to pass, I say, our teacher foretold, he who is both son and apostle of God the Father of all and the ruler Jesus Christ, from whom also we have the name of Christians. Whence we become more assured of all the things he taught us, since whatever he beforehand foretold should come to pass, is seen in fact coming to pass. And this is the work of God, to tell of a thing before it happens, and as it was foretold so to show it happening. It were possible to pause here and add no more, reckoning that we demand what is just and true, but because we are well aware that it is not easy suddenly to change a mind possessed by ignorance, we intend to add a few things, for the sake of persuading those who love the truth, knowing that it is not impossible to put ignorance to flight by presenting the truth. Chapter 13. Christians Serve God Rationally What sober-minded man, then, will not acknowledge that we are not atheists, worshipping as we do the Maker of this universe, and declaring, as we have been taught, that he has no need of streams of blood and libations and incense, whom we praise to the utmost of our power by the exercise of prayer and thanksgiving for all things wherewith we are supplied, as we have been taught that the only honor that is worthy of him is not to consume by fire what he has brought into being for our sustenance, but to use it for ourselves and those who need, and with gratitude to him to offer thanks by invocations and hymns for our creation, and for all the means of health, and for the various qualities of the different kinds of things, and for the changes of the seasons, 
and to present before him petitions for our existing again in incorruption through faith in him. Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, who also was born for this purpose, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the times of Tiberius Caesar, and that we reasonably worship him, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, and holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third, we will prove. For they proclaim our madness to consist in this, that we give to a crucified man a place second to the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of all. For they do not discern the mystery that is herein, to which, as we make it plain to you, we pray you to give heed. Chapter 14 The Demons Misrepresent Christian Doctrine for we forewarn you to be on your guard, lest those demons whom we have been accusing should deceive you, and quite divert you from reading and understanding what we say. For they strive to hold you their slaves and servants, and sometimes by appearances in dreams, and sometimes by magical impositions, they subdue all who make no strong opposing effort for their own salvation. And thus do we also, since our persuasion by the word, stand aloof from them, i.e. the demons, and follow the only unbegotten God through his Son, we who formerly delighted in fornication, but now embrace chastity alone, we who formerly used magical arts, dedicate ourselves to the good and unbegotten God, we who valued above all things the acquisition of wealth and possessions, now bring what we have into a common stock, and communicate to every one in need, we who hated and destroyed one another, and on account of their different manners would not live with men of a different tribe, now, since the coming of Christ, live familiarly with them, and pray for our enemies, and endeavor to persuade those who hate us unjustly to live conformably to the good precepts of Christ, to the end that they may become partakers with us of the same joyful hope of a reward from God the ruler of all. But lest we should seem to be reasoning sophistically, we consider it right, before giving you the promised explanation, to cite a few precepts given by Christ himself, and be it yours, as powerful rulers, to inquire whether we have been taught and do teach these things truly. Brief and concise utterances fell from him, for he was no sophist, but his word was the power of God. Chapter 15. What Christ Himself Taught Concerning chastity, he uttered such sentiments as these, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart before God. And, if thy right eye offend thee, cut it out, for it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye, than, having two eyes, to be cast into everlasting fire. And, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced from another husband, committeth adultery. And, there are some who have been made eunuchs of men, and some who were born eunuchs, and some who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, but all cannot receive this saying. So that all who, by human law, are twice married, are in the eye of our master sinners, and those who look upon a woman to lust after her. For not only he who in act commits adultery is rejected by him, but also he who desires to commit adultery, since not only our works, but also our thoughts, are open before God. And many, both men and women, who have been Christ's disciples from childhood, remain pure at the age of sixty or seventy years, and I boast that I could produce such from every race of men. For what shall I say, too, of the countless multitude of those who have reformed in temperate habits, and learned these things? For Christ called not the just nor the chaste to repentance, but the ungodly, and the licentious, and the unjust. His words being, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For the heavenly Father desires rather the repentance than the punishment of the sinner. And of our love to all, he taught thus, If ye love them that love you, what new thing do ye? For even fornicators do this. But I say unto you, Pray for your enemies, and love them that hate you, and bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. And that we should communicate to the needy, and do nothing for glory, he said, Give to him that asketh, and from him that would borrow turn not away. For if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what new thing do ye? Even the publicans do this. 
Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where robbers break through, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. For what is a man profited, if he should gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for it? Lay up treasure therefore in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And, be ye kind and merciful, as your Father also is kind and merciful, and maketh his Son to rise on sinners, and the righteous, and the wicked. Take no thought what ye shall eat, or what ye shall put on. Are ye not better than the birds and the beasts? And God feedeth them. Take no thought therefore what ye shall eat, or what ye shall put on. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added unto you. For where his treasure is, there also is the mind of a man. And, do not these things to be seen of men, otherwise ye have no reward from your Father which is in heaven. Chapter 16. Concerning Patience and Swearing. And concerning our being patient of injuries, and ready to serve all, and free from anger, this is what he said, to him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak or coat, forbid not. And whosoever shall be angry is in danger of the fire. And every one that compelleth thee to go with him a mile, follow him too. And let your good works shine before men, that they, seeing them, may glorify your Father which is in heaven. For we ought not to strive, neither has he desired us to be imitators of wicked men, but he has exhorted us to lead all men, by patience and gentleness, from shame and the love of evil. And this indeed is proved in the case of many who once were of your way of thinking, but have changed their violent and tyrannical disposition, being overcome either by the constancy which they have witnessed in their neighbors' lives, or by the extraordinary forbearance they have observed in their fellow travelers when defrauded, or by the honesty of those with whom they have transacted business. And with regard to our not swearing at all, and always speaking the truth, he enjoined as follows, Swear not at all, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And that we ought to worship God alone, he thus persuaded us. The greatest commandment is, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve, with all thy heart, and with all thy strength, the Lord God that made thee. And when a certain man came to him and said, Good master, he answered and said, There is none good but God only, who made all things. And let those who are not found living as he taught be understood to be no Christians, even though they profess with the lip the precepts of Christ. For not those who make profession, but those who do the works, shall be saved according to his word. Not every one who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For whosoever heareth me, and doeth my sayings, heareth him that sent me. And many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not eaten and drunk in thy name, and done wonders? And then will I say unto them, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Then shall there be wailing and gnashing of teeth, when the righteous shall shine as the sun, and the wicked are sent into everlasting fire. For many shall come in my name, clothed outwardly in sheep's clothing, but inwardly being ravening wolves. By their works ye shall know them. And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And as to those who are not living pursuant to these his teachings, and are Christians only in name, we demand that all such be punished by you. Chapter 17. Christ Taught Civil Obedience And everywhere we, more readily than all men, endeavor to pay to those appointed by you the taxes, both ordinary and extraordinary, as we have been taught by him. For at that time some came to him and asked him, if one ought to pay tribute to Caesar. And he answered, Tell me, whose image does the coin bear? And they said, Caesar's. And again he answered them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Whence to God alone we render worship, but in other things we gladly serve you. 
acknowledging you as kings and rulers of men, and praying that with your kingly power you be found to possess also sound judgment. But if you pay no regard to our prayers and frank explanations, we shall suffer no loss, since we believe, or rather indeed are persuaded, that every man will suffer punishment in eternal fire according to the merit of his deed, and will render account according to the power he has received from God, as Christ intimated when he said, To whom God has given more, of him shall more be required. Chapter 18. Proof of Immortality and the Resurrection For reflect upon the end of each of the preceding kings, how they died the death common to all, which, if it issued in insensibility, would be a godsend to all the wicked. But since sensation remains to all who have ever lived, and eternal punishment is laid up, i.e. for the wicked, see that ye neglect not to be convinced, and to hold as your belief, that these things are true. For let even necromancy, and the divinations you practice by immaculate children, and the evoking of departed human souls, and those who are called among the magi, dream-senders and assistant spirits, familiars, and all that is done by those who are skilled in such matters, let these persuade you that even after death souls are in a state of sensation, and those who are seized and cast about by the spirits of the dead, whom all call demoniacs or madmen, and what you repute as oracles, both of Amphilochus, Dodana, Pitho, and as many other such as exist, and the opinions of your authors, Empedocles and Pythagoras, Plato and Socrates, and the pit of Homer, and the descent of Ulysses to inspect these things, and all that has been uttered of a like kind. Such favor as you grant to these, grant also to us, who not less but more firmly than they believe in God. Since we expect to receive again our own bodies, though they be dead and cast into the earth, for we maintain that with God nothing is impossible. Chapter 19. The Resurrection Possible and to any thoughtful person would anything appear more incredible than, if we were not in the body, and someone were to say that it was possible that from a small drop of human seed, bones and sinews and flesh be formed into a shape such as we see? For let this now be said hypothetically. If you yourselves were not such as you are now, and born of such parents and causes, and one were to show you human seed and a picture of a man, and were to say with confidence that from such a substance such a being could be produced, would you believe before you saw the actual production? No one will dare to deny that such a statement would surpass belief. In the same way, then, you are now incredulous because you have never seen a dead man rise again. But as at first you would not have believed it possible that such persons could be produced from the small drop, and yet now you see them thus produced, so also judge ye that it is not impossible that the bodies of men, after they have been dissolved, and like seeds resolved into earth, should in God's appointed time rise again and put on incorruption. For what power worthy of God those imagine, who say, that each thing returns to that from which it was produced, and that beyond this not even God himself can do anything, we are unable to conceive. But this we see clearly, that they would not have believed it possible that they could have become such and produced from such materials, as they now see both themselves and the whole world to be, and that it is better to believe even what is impossible to our own nature and to men, than to be unbelieving like the rest of the world, we have learned. For we know that our Master Jesus Christ said, that what is impossible with men is possible with God, and, fear not them that kill you, and after that can do no more, but fear him who after death is able to cast both soul and body into hell. And hell is a place where those are to be punished who have lived wickedly, and who do not believe that those things which God has taught us by Christ will come to pass.